In today's show, we're recapping all of the action from Monday across the NBA. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me on Twitter, as always, at redrock underscore bball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. This episode is brought to you by Truebill. Truebill is the new app that saves you money by helping you identify and stop paying for the subscriptions that you don't need or you don't want and can even negotiate better deals on the ones that you want to keep. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy basketball your first listen every day we are free and available on all platforms we are here to talk about um, monday in in the nba news um what a recap of the six games as well so let's get straight in and talk some news and unfortunately he's back from the ab issue but now damian lillard is popping up on the injury report due to hamstring issue he's questionable for tomorrow's game I would wonder whether he, you know, he, there is that issue with compensation for the abdominal issue that's led to a strain in the hammy. But overall, it's just been a dreadful season from Lillard, even though over the last week, he was the fantasy player of the week. So that's interesting. Keep that in mind. But this is now just another thing to add on to that with Lillard. Um, yeah, look, we just we don't know when CJ McCollum is coming back in. That is helping Lillard's value. If it wasn't the hamstring issue, maybe I'd look at him as a bit of a sell high. If you could convince someone to give you a top 15 asset back, you probably couldn't, but that would be something looking worth looking at. Some more COVID absences, Patrick Beverly and Jared Vanderbilt bar in Minnesota. So that means Malik Beasley really gets that bump there with Edwards also there uh, out in COVID. So Beasley's a 12-team ad. You look at uh, Maxi Kleber who's also, well, no, actually, I don't know why I just introduced him. I'll talk about him in a sec. Jaden McDaniels is the other one that we take a look at. Naz Reed in like 14-team leagues will also get some value. Um, Jalen Noel in deeper formats can become an ad. Uh, maybe even Leandro Balmaro or Jordan McLaughlin in deeper formats, they get a boost. I, I mentioned Cleber already. He's out in COVID protocols. Now, so Dorian Finney-Smith, make sure Finney-Smith is not available in any leagues. Yeah, he should be... Well, that's not true. 10 teams, you can probably leave him, but 12s, he needs to be rostered. They're, they're without Kleber now. Uh, Cauley Stein, Doncic, Porzingis is questionable. Reggie Bullock is out. So there is some minutes available there at the form. They don't have many big men at all on that team uh, who are healthy and ready to go, especially with... Um, yeah, if Porzingis is out, then you're really, really yeah, diving bottom of the barrel. Maybe even the C-parter himself, Moses Brown jumps in in that situation. Um, PJ Tucker is out for tomorrow's game with his knee injury. So is Jimmy Butler. We don't know. Um, we don't know where, where or what, what the long-term issue is here with PJ. He had an MRI, but we don't have any results on that. Um, we'll see. We'll see how uh, he goes. He was putting up some top 100-ish type of numbers. I didn't really think there was any hope of that being able to continue. But you know, now that he's out with this knee injury, I'd feel all right if you wanted to, to drop him. If you did happen to add him in the first place, I think dropping him ends up being okay. And the NBA did institute a new signing policy, which I think the most important thing to note for this from a fantasy perspective is it minimizes the chance of any postponements. I know the NHL has just shut down for a little bit of time. I honestly don't think that's the right decision. The NBA is not trending that way at all. The NHL is a little bit different because of cross-border travel and so much cross-border travel. Um, I don't think shutting things down solves any problems, um, but the NBA has gone a different direction. This is lasting until the January 19th at this stage. For every person that you get a positive COVID test, you can sign a replacement player. If you have two COVID positives, you have to sign one player. For three cases, you have to sign two players. Four cases, you have to sign three players. So you have to sign extra guys. The replacement players will not count towards the salary cap or the luxury tax. They're on 10-day hardship exemptions. So teams like the Nets, it's not going to cost them $500,000 to sign someone. So that's beneficial. Two-way players also no, no longer have any games caps. 
So for two-way guys who have been getting games pumped into them early in the season, there's no restriction on how many games they can play now. Um, and you're going to have a bunch of blokes coming in and getting signed over the coming days. Names that you've never heard of or names that you've forgotten about. CJ Miles, for example, signed with the Boston Celtics. In the large part, these guys are just going to be there to make up healthy numbers and they're going to be playing your yeah, 10 minutes, 7 minutes, 12 minutes and not really impacting any fantasy leagues. But it is worth noting and keeping up to date with those signings. Of course, we'll track all that over on Basketball Monster and they'll all be included in daily projections and in, in season-long projections. And then they'll be moved off rosters when they are no longer a part of the team. But that that is these moves are made to try and prevent postponements. I still think the NBA needs to go in a different direction with testing of asymptomatic players, but they're not really going to go in that direction, I wouldn't have thought at this stage. But this is the step here. And again, that should assuage any concerns of a league shutdown and uh, assuage any concerns of um, further postponements. I just don't... These signing signing policy, I think, puts that possibility really very far down the back burner. We had those games postponed that this week. I don't think that's going to be an issue for us as we move forward here. We had a Watfo coming through from loading underscore 224. Loading, thank you for the Watfo. He says, what are the odds that Kyrie Irving is a top five fantasy player on a per game basis? Now, of course, he's not going to be a top five player based on, yeah totals because he's going to miss over half of the remaining games. But on a per game basis, I think now actually my projections have him marginally, marginally sitting at number five because when he plays, the load will be eased on KD. It'll be eased on Harden. I would imagine they'll sit them some games. They'll push back a little bit. If Kyrie's only playing 17 games, 18 games, I've got him projected for 18 games. If he's only playing 18 games, He'll go hard in those games and those guys can step back a little bit and they step it up in the other games. I've got him at number five per game. But that's with a razor thin margin between him at five, Trey Young at six, um, yeah, Embiid at seven. Like it's really, really, and the drop off between four and five is pretty significant. But the difference between five through to nine is not that different. So I'm saying it's 42% that he can sneak into that number five slot because I have got him at five. I don't think he can get any higher than five. And I think there's a chance that he does drop off from there. But remember, this is per game. And if you're playing 18 games, if he has to leave one game early because he gets injured and plays five minutes in that, yeah, that, that screws him as well. So I'm going 42%. What do you guys think? Please drop your Watfo for tomorrow down below and let me know your thoughts on the Kyrie Irving Watfo here as well. But what are the odds that you've got too many subscriptions? Ones that you don't even know about anymore. You signed up during the COVID pandemic, which of course is still ongoing, and you just forgot about them. You would never guess how much these people are charging you unless you really look into it. That's why Truebill's here. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions that you don't need, that you don't want, or that you simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720, as I can't speak, per year on Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. Truebill has over 2 million users and it helped them save $100 million. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start cancelling today at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now, Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash locked on NBA. Bet online has you covered all season. More props, more odds, more lines as football season cracks towards the playoffs. Bet online is your number one spot, in fact, for all sports action this season. So head to the new updated desktop or use your mobile device and sign up today using the promo code locked on and you can receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. From basketball to football, the NHL, boxing, UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait and take advantage of all of the fantastic offers available for the 2021 season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. Okay, let's look at the top added players over the last 24 hours. Look at some of these numbers. Chemezi Metu, up 48%. Told you I thought he was a pretty good ad. Um, people have obviously followed, not me, but followed the trend of adding him. Um, so that's great. Kimball Walker, up 43%. Hello. 
there's a chance he plays like one game this week. Derek Rose could even be back for the game tomorrow. And then you get the slow trickle of other guys coming in. And Walker literally might not play. But I don't mind taking a flyer on it. I added him in a slightly deeper than usual 12-team league I've got with a bunch of the guys from NBC Sports Edge and a few other fantasy analysts. I added Kemba for this week and dropped Emmanuel quickly, was it? No, um, Juice McBride is who I dropped. But I don't think it's necessarily going to work. But I just tried it just in case they keep him in and he gets three starts this week. I don't think it's possible. I don't, or I don't think it's likely, but it is possible. Nick Batum's up 38%. Seems a lot. I think Batum's fine to add, but I don't think he's must. While Robin Lopez up 29% while Wendell Carter's out. Um, Precious Achua, the big sneeze, up 29%. I think that's okay, but it's still probably more for 14s. Uh, Gary Harris up by 24%. No! No worries with the, the, the issues there in Orlando. Fournier is up 14% for the old disease scrotum. I reckon that's probably, you know what, that's probably fine. Again, with all the injuries there in New York. Uh, Trimura Kiki up 14 No problem. Let's see what happens. It may not last long, but it's fine for now. So we just don't have a diagnosis yet on Wendell Carter. And Gary Bird himself. Garrison Matthews up 14%. With Jalen Green likely back next game, I'm not sure that Gary is going to remain as a 12-team league player. I think he's just a fringe guy anyway, but I understand adding him at least for today's game. In terms of droppable players or guys that were dropped over the last 24 hours, Blake Griffin, Kessler Edwards, down 43 and 29% respectively with the Nets post moments. Understandable. PJ Tucker down 29% with his injury. Understandable. Uh, Nick Claxton uh, dropped with his wrist injury and the absence of all the post moments. Sure, drop him. Cody Martin with COVID down 29%. Uh, not a problem at all. We've got... Um, that's not Dylan Brooks. That's um, Armani Brooks, the designer, down 19%. Actually had a good game today, but I don't mind moving on from him with Jalen Green out. Um, you've got Saban Lee down 19%. Frank Jackson down 19%, both in Detroit. Again, with the Corey Joseph reintroduction to the rotation, some frustrations there. And Cam Thomas down 14% as well, which, which again, thinks makes sense given the absences there. Or the post, again, the postponements. That's the word I'm looking for. The postponements in... Um, in Brooklyn, so that's that's what we're uh, what we're looking at there. All right, um, what else are we looking at? Oh, you know what? Let's let's get into games. First game, big win, massive win for Philadelphia here. They were down until quite late in this game, and in the end, they get that victory, one hundred eight, one hundred three on the road with literally no point guard. Um, Embiid was a monster. Forty minutes, forty one and ten. Five assists, two steals, and four blocks. That's 74 fantasy points for those of you with a calculator at home. That is a gigantic, gigantic number. He was immense here. So without um, Tyrese Maxey and Andre Drummond and Shake Milton, Seth Curry started a point guard. Curry had 26 points with seven assists on 71%. So he took increased minutes, added increased assists, added increased shooting percentages. It's all that great combination together. It means there's going to be a drop-off, but it was great nonetheless. And the thick hogsman himself, Tobias Harris. Um, I think I am a TH. T to the H. Yeah, TH for life. He'd been struggling, but this is good. 25 and 7 with three threes, and Dan Green played 40 minutes. He almost got the Richie Benno, but just ticked over with one extra steal. Two threes, three steals, and two blocks, and the painter Matisse Thibel hit a key three late in his seven points and had three steals in a block. Both Green and Thibel are guys that you're streaming in for defensive stats and not must roster guys. Isaiah Joe played 26 off the bench. He scored one point. That was the only point their bench players scored. It was him. It was Goldfinger, Charles Bassey. It was Aaron Henry and Miles Powell. They're the four blokes who played off the bench. The only one who played over 10 minutes was Joe, and he hit that one free throw. Just a wild um, discrepancy between the starters and the bench unit there. For the Celtics, Jalen Brown. He was pretty good. JB, you've done it again. 30 points. 9 of 10 from the line is great. 41 from the field is not. But 4 assists, 2 steals, really good numbers there. And Jason Tatum, not efficient at all, 36%. But 17, 9, and 6, and 2 steals, 2 blocks, pretty good. He is now up to the 24th ranked player over the season. While Marcus Smart, did he get the buy-low bump? Well, you judge for yourself. 15, 6, and 3, 2 steals, a block with 2 triples and 60% shooting. I would say yes. And of course, the buy-low bump is completely fake. But it's also when a guy's been underperforming, you do expect something to change. And it changed. And he shot well and he played well. You know I've been banging the drum about Dennis Schroeder for a long time. I don't think he's particularly good. Yeah, that's me personally. And I've been saying he's a sell high. And when guys come back, he's going to be limited. 
Well, guys didn't even really come back yet, and he still got limited. In fact, Peyton Pritchard closed the game over him. That's two disappointing games in a row for Schroeder, and over the last two weeks, he's the 231st-ranked player. This is without Al Horford, Rob Williams, Grant Williams, Josh Richardson. It's not trending well for him, is it? I think in a 10-team league, if you've got him, you drop him. Like, if there's someone else you want, you drop him. He requires Smart, Brown, or Tatum, one of those guys to be out, to be a must-roster player. He started here, but he just is not that good. In a 12, maybe you can hold. But when the two Williamses, Richo and Horford, come back, I'm not sure he plays even 28 minutes a night at this stage. He'll be better than this, but is it enough to be a 12-team league guy? I vote no. Ennis Freedom played 40 minutes with Williams and Horford out. He had a double-double. That's what he does, 15 and 11. And he, everything else is what he does as well. Zero assists, one steal, and zero blocks. 70% shooting. He's a solid enough stream option with those guys out. We, Rob Williams was out today due to personal issues. We hope everything's okay with him, so we don't really have a timeline on how long he's going to be out. Talked about Pritchard. He had 14 in 22 minutes, two threes, two steals. Now, he was dreadful to start this season, but now the way he's playing, establishing himself over Aaron Neesmith um, and probably over Romeo Langford, although Langford did play 25 minutes for a Tony Snell-esque one rebound and one block. Good block it was. But yeah, he just is one of the worst fantasy players you'll ever see. He just does not produce anything. Pritchard's a name to watch. It's just for like 16 teamers at this stage, but he is a name to watch just to see what they do with his playing time. Um, you know, can he establish himself in a role? Does it mean if he is playing well that they look to trade Dennis Schroeder? They're obviously not committed to Schroeder at all for any portion of the future. So you know, there's, there's a possibility that um, Pritchard can play his way into a role large enough and play well enough that takes Schroeder um, to be able to trade for a draft pick or for an asset or something else. So just just keep an eye on that, especially those of you who are playing in deep leagues, that someone like a Peyton Pritchard could be um, or could end up an option for you just based on, well, not based on anything you know, concrete, but based on the the pattern and, the and honestly, the way that he played here in comparison to Schroeder. If he is able to get going, what he provides, that off-ball shooting, is something that Schroeder does not provide. Um, and and that ends up being a relative positive. I don't think there's anything else to really talk about in this one. Bruno Fernando went bananas for about a 30-second period, blocked two shots, one of them was called a foul, and then he did nothing else after that. But if you are listening to this podcast, you're obviously a smart bloke, but you listen to this podcast, another podcast, for the power of in the inside track. You switch to Boost Mobile for the power of saving money because with Boost, you get the power of a free 5G phone so you can listen to the latest episodes and keep up with your favorite players and team. The power also of three unlimited data lines for 30 bucks per month per line so your family can share all of the insights and the power of one of America's largest 5G networks so you can do it all at the speed of 5G. With all that money you'll save and all that edge you'll gain, you'll, just how powerful will you become? Do I need to be worried? Do I need to call the authorities with all that power you're going to have? Maybe. We'll see. Switch to Boost Mobile and find out. Get a free Samsung Galaxy A32. 32? 32. That would be the English pronunciation. 5G when you switch to one of America's largest 5G networks. More power to save Boost Mobile. Free phone limited to new customers and one per line. Additional restrictions apply. Offers and coverage not available everywhere or for all phones and networks. See BoostMobile.com for details. Game two. The Chicago Bulls pumped the Houston Rockets. Shouldn't be too much of a surprise, but remember the Rockets did knock these blokes off last time. But 133, 118, it was really, really comfortable in the end here for the Bulls. The uh, the Rockets brought back Armani Brooks, the designer, and put him straight back into the starting lineup over Josh Christopher. I don't like that. Brooks, though, played well. 15 points, three triples, two steals, one block. There is streaming value in Brooksy for sure, but it's more 16 team, maybe 14 team at this stage. KJ Martin, 15 points. Really no peripherals, one rebound. Yeah, that's not true. He had a steal on a block. He didn't have a triple one. He had a quintuple one. One three, one rebound, one assist, one steal, one block. You don't see a line like that very often. Him getting to 26 minutes a night when everyone's healthy is really tough to see, though. The Crucifix had 23 and 11 in 29 minutes, while Eric Gordon had 10 points and six assists. Gordon is a 12-team league guy at this stage. Christopher, I thought he still was all right, but only 20 minutes. 10 points and three rebounds there. So he's just a name to watch long-term. And I am still holding the delicate dancer, Alperen Sengun. It's a delicate dance in just 17 steps. Eight, five, and two is not great. One steal. It is just a luxury stash at this point, and we're just hoping for things to change. But if you're in dire straits, I understand moving on. I get it. I wouldn't, but I get it. Uh, Gary Bird played 26 minutes. Garrison Matthews, six points, two threes. He's 141st now over the last two weeks. It just He's not must roster. 
If you want to move on in a 12-team league, I totally get that. The Wild Thing had 16-5-6. and six. Jay Sean Tate, good numbers for him. I worry about what his minutes and role looks like later in the season. I don't think he should be viewed as an absolute key foundational piece for this team. He's a little bit older. His best role long-term is probably as a sixth man or a very low-usage guy um, playing some defense, like a PJ Tucker-ish sort of a player. But I, yeah, I don't really think that his numbers are going to sustain. He played only 22 minutes in this one as well. Had some foul trouble. But you're holding for now. I'm just not, I'm not sold on it all continuing. The downside um, for Alex, well, not for Alex Crusoe, for the Chicago Bulls was Alex Caruso spraining his foot six minutes in. He had zero points and two assists there. Hold until we find out the diagnosis. Lonzo, he's playing. Lonzo Ball over the last two weeks is the 12th ranked player. 19, 5, and 8, five steals, four threes, and a block. I think I took him at 26 in one draft. And then when I did it, I know people were shitting on me for it. And I went, I'm Josh, kids, cover him. Josh, you're a fucking idiot. Like, what are you doing? Why the fuck are you taking him at this spot? I'm okay with that. He's the 31st ranked player. He is fulfilling the high level fantasy value that I envisaged for him when he came into the league as a rookie. Took a while to get here, but he's dominating. DeRozan had 23, 26, 3, and 6. A triple zero, but good shooting. Great from the line. Another great game from DeMar. He's the sixth ranked player over the last two weeks. Well, Kobe White had to start the second half with Caruso out. Dropped in 24 points in 32 minutes with 5-3. So if Caruso's out, Zach Levine, the skater boy, if he is out, well, he is out. If you need some punch for your scoring on your team, yeah, Kobe can do that. He can't do jack shit else, but he can do that. So if you are looking for a scoring boost, maybe he's a guy to look at. It's Bosa. It's Big Bosa. Bosa is it. Bosa, bitch. Just another shitty-ish sort of night. Like, not bad, but just annoying. 18 and 6 with two threes and two blocks. Guess where Vooch has ranked over the last two weeks? What's that you say? 150th? You're correct. Spot on. Bang. Well done. Congratulations to everybody that said 150th. That's shitful. He's 72nd this year. Also shitful. Now, I didn't think that he'd be a guy that you take at the turn of the first round, start of the second. I was off on that. But I did think that you could get him at the turn of the second, start of the third, or maybe at like 30, 33, 34. Yeah, there were warning signs. I knew the warning signs. Lower usage. The fact that last year was his only good year of being that elite shooter. All that worried me. Didn't think it'd be this bad. Is he a buy low? Sure. Should we be even considering him anywhere close to a top 30 player? No chance. Top 50? Maybe. Like, maybe. Alfonso McKinney signed the first 10-day hardship. It was That ended. They re-signed him, and he played 29 minutes. 16 points with four threes for Alfonso. Um, just a deeper league stream, though. And we got minutes out of Tyler Cook, Devin Dotson. Even got three minutes out of Marco Simonovic. Well, Javante Green started and just did nothing. Four points in 27 minutes. I know a lot of Bulls fans love him. I do not think he's a good player. I, I just, I, I don't. I think they need to upgrade that position in their rotation to stay lineup. up. I, I don't think he's good. But again, Bulls fans really, really like him. And we'll see. Maybe maybe he grows on me as as the uh, as the season progresses. We'll find out, won't we? The Thunder didn't lose by seventy three points today, so I guess you can class that as win. I don't. Know. I'm just getting word that they actually won. Oh, send them, send it to Seattle, guys. Fuck, take their draft picks, find them, mate. This is a disgrace. Basketball's a disgrace. This team's shocking. How can this possibly be allowed to go on? Well, everyone who said that get fucked. Like it was a terrible loss, obviously. The Thunder aren't the worst team in the NBA. They weren't the worst team in the NBA last year. They just beat the Clippers and the Grizzlies on back-to-back games. Their coach is really good. Their roster is not. Their coach is really good. I don't know why I always feel like I need to defend the Thunder because I guess the takes about them just become so ridiculous that it just boils my blood. 102, Oklahoma City, 99, Memphis. Let's talk about the Thunder. Shea, another rough is shooting night. Missed all five of his threes, but still had 23, five, and four with three steals. He's now 40th over the last two weeks. I still think he's a buy low, to be fair. I know people are so worried. Oh, he's going to like cut his, cut his toenail and then he's going to be out for six months. I just don't think that's going to happen. I don't think he's going to get fake injured out of the season. I, I don't. Again, I could be wrong. Josh Giddy, must roster player, 19, five, and 11. That was shocking from the free throw line for sure, but he's must roster. Darius Baisley on the bench, 24 minutes again. That looks like his new role, but he brought four blocks. He's a really good 
Blocks and rebounds streamer at the moment. Good for points leagues, but there is some 12-team category value just for those streaming categories. While Lou Dort, Lou Dort, say it again. My person hitting the button, buttons is slow. No, my son is also named Bort. And by person hitting the buttons, I mean me. Um, I am consistently skeptical about this bloke being a high-volume, high-efficiency scorer. So when he has a game like this, I go, ah, yeah, okay, fair enough. 12 points on 15 shots. There was shit house. But then he'll probably go out tomorrow and drop in 27 on 12 shots, and I'll look like a dickhead. I just cannot believe that he can be a high-volume, high-efficiency high scorer. And he has been at times this year, for sure. He is, what, the 98th-ranked player this season and remains a must-roster. They changed things up. They started Joe Rogan, Jeremiah Robinson Earl, at power forward and favors at center. Neither one cracked 20 minutes. We had Poku playing 21 off the bench. We had Kenrich Williams playing 23 off the bench. And by the way, if you're in a 14-team league, the Oklahoma City mudflap, Kenrich Williams, he's got some 14-team value at the moment. Just does bits and pieces right across the board. For the Grizzlies, they were rolling without Ja Morant, and he comes back and they lose. Is that a coincidence? Yes, it is a coincidence. Like, they don't need to trade Jar. They're not better without Jar. They've got to figure out how things work. But it's stop with that bullshit. If anyone here is thinking that, it's bullshit. Des Bain was on my um, buy low, sell high show today. The sell high is massively open because he still had a massive game with Jar back. 25 points, took 20 shots. Now, of course, there was one bloke who took more than them. Shout out to Brooksy. But, yeah, that was good from Bain. He had seven boards as well with five threes. The absolute sell high window is still wide open. It is massively open. Sell high. Try to get top 60 back. As for Jar, told you he'd be back. Told you he'd be back this week. And we still have no idea what injury he had. We don't know. And I know someone complained yesterday. How dare you fantasy guys think that the teams and their privacy uh, demand the information on the injuries. They play in the NBA. It is, that is part of their contract. We need to, th- that information needs to be made public. That is not a HIPAA violation or whatever bullshit you throw out there. This stuff needs to be made public. And the fact that the Grizzlies get away with saying nothing specific and giving no information is pretty frustrating. Because this stuff needs to be put out there. It is part of the rules. Anyway, Jar was back. 16, 6, and 8, 2 steals and a block, 28 minutes. He's, that's great. It's awesome that he's back. It's sick. Um, of course, Dylan Brooks, after I praised him the other day, had 19 points on 39% shooting. Didn't have the assist, didn't get to the line, was just back in full jack mode for Brooksy, which is just shit Brooks mode. Can he coexist with Jar and Bain? That's the question, isn't it? The way Paul D'Anthony Melton had four points on 13%, that's bad. He had five assists to steal on a block. I think with Morant back, remember there was no Tyus Jones in this game as well. With Morant back, it's going to be hard for him to be a hold. Well, Stephen Adams had eight points in about four minutes to start the game. Oh, sorry, eight rebounds in about four minutes. Ended with 14 boards, but played just 20 minutes. So interesting to see those minutes drop. To me, he's just a streamer. Well, Jaron Jackson had 15 and six with three threes and two steals. There is a nickname for him. And I know it's the Triple J. And yeah, Triple J is obviously a radio station here in Australia. But I've just I've got to tweak it. There's something there. I've got to find what it is, the Triple J-ness of him. Maybe the Hot 100, Jaron Jackson Jr.? It's not quite there, is it? I, I've got to work on that. I'm just letting you in on the on the, on the workings here. No Ty Jones, Brandon Clark, or Zaya Williams in this game. Um, Kyle Anderson, please, he's not a 12-team league guy. Four points in 22 minutes. Absolutely no need for him to be rostered in those formats. You add him in a situation where, like, a Jaron Jackson gets hurt, but otherwise, he just is not going to play enough minutes to, uh, to matter in most cases. Let's look at the next game. The Charlotte Hornets and the Utah Jazz. Shout out to the Hornets for losing by uh, 10 points here. I thought they were going to get killed early on. They, they fought back 112-102 was the final score. For the Hornets, Gordon Haywood was ruled out with a back injury and Cody Martin was out in COVID protocol. So remember that when you look at the 26 minutes that Jalen McDaniels played, 14-5 and five with two blocks. I think McDaniels is a solid enough player, but it's just not enough for me to look at in 12 or 14 team leagues. Well, Kelly Oubre. He was on the sell high a couple of weeks ago. He's really fallen off. Yeah, five points in 31 minutes on 22%. That was always completely unsustainable. I do not believe Cali Uber is a must-roster 12-team league guy. And I'm having my doubts about PJ Washington. 20 minutes, six points, no foul trouble. In fact, he had just foul, four fouls. With Mason Plumley back, with getting the rest of the team back in, I, I'm not... Remember, start of the season when they were all healthy, he was not 12-team valuable. Hold him but I'm not sure it sticks. 
Rogier was on the buy low. He had 20 points, six rebounds, four assists, and four threes. Still shot shit, 37% from the field, but good volume. While Bridges had 21 and 11, and Lamello had 21, 6 and 11 on uh, both of those blokes, 40% shooting. Um, not much else going on. Plumlee had four and nine with a steal and a block. He's just a deeper league guy, though, not a 12-team league player. Well, for the Jazz, uh, Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert. 23 and 21. And would you ever imagine you'd see a Rudy Gobert line where he was four of 10 from the field, but he was 15 of 16 from the free throw line? And only had one block. Just one of the most backwards lines you'll ever see. 53 fantasy points. Bogdanovich dropped in 23 points with two rebounds and zero assists. That is, that's just so boyan. Um, Hassan Whiteside, good streaming value for him. Three blocks in 12 minutes. That's all he is. It's not a must roster, please. While Jordan Clarkson. J-O-R-D-A-N-C-L-A-R-K-S-O-N. 11 points in 22 minutes with five rebounds and three threes. Not must roster. Conley had 14 and six. O'Neal had 13 Rebounds with a triple one on 11%. He had that real strong run where he was putting up a top 80 value. That is not how you value Royce O'Neal. He's a solid enough, he's absolutely a 14-team league guy, solid enough in 12s, but the upside's not really there for me. And I know that I'll say that and say he doesn't have much upside. Then he comes out and there's like you know, 20 points with seven steals and it looked like an absolute knob. But he just isn't. He just isn't a high upside player. Well, Ingles is only a stream option for 12-teamers when Conley is out. He had six points in his 27 minutes, and Rudy Gay, five points in 18 minutes. Remember in Rudy Gay's first game, he had like 80% shooting from three, and there were people literally adding him in 12-team leagues, and there was never any chance that that was going to be able to sustain. But, you know, here we are. All right, that's good stuff. The next game. The Sacramento Kings and the Golden State Warriors. Obviously, the Kings are undermanned. So are the Warriors, though. Um, the Kings, yeah, on a back-to-back, it was tough on the road. 98-113, they go down. But Tyrese Halliburton kept going. 41 minutes, 24 points, 11 assists, 3 steals, and 2 threes. His usage is up. His assists are up. We talked about this on the Buy Low, Sell High show. You're going to have this Sell High window open until Fox comes back. There is a possibility that Fox gets traded. When And I said this on the show earlier today. Well, I bloody hope I said it. I'm pretty sure I did. You you can sell high on him as long as you're getting your top 30, top 25 value, which value back. Otherwise, just write it out and enjoy the top 15, top 12 value that he's currently giving you. Because there is a, a decent chance that maybe he does have this value later in the season. But the window is open, obviously. Bud Heald had 18 points in 40 minutes, six triples and four steals, really starting to step up now with those absences. Well, Chemezi Metu, I think he's a 12-team ad. Now, I know that we could get the return of Davis and then also um, Bagley. That could impact him. And Holmes and Fox also have an impact. But 16 and 6 with a steal and a block, he probably fits the best out of those other guys. He's worth trying. While the pencil, Harrison Barnes. Barnesy. 19 points with four triples. He's getting back. He's slowly getting back to where he needs to be. Um, Tristan Thompson had 10 and 9. He's like a deeper league stream. While unfortunately, or yeah, maybe fortunately, depending on what you decide to do with Damian Jones, he didn't repeat his 23-point career best scoring performance. In fact, he went out and scored zero. He did have two blocks. Um, he can be at least a block streamer while these other centers are out, but there's not a huge amount of long-term value in him. Um, not much else going on there. Harkless played 25 minutes for seven points. That's only of use for like 30 team leagues. I actually have him on my 30 team roster and I actually started in this week. So shout out to you, Mo, for giving me seven, two, and one in that situation. The Warriors were without Andrew Wiggins and Jordan Poole. So they decided to start Jonathan Kaminga. He lasted six minutes before leaving with a back issue that the Warriors said was fine and he was going to come back. And then he never did come back. So that was interesting. They started Juan Toscano Anderson over him in the second half. Now, Kaminga would only be a deeper league guy anyway. But what this meant is it freed up minutes for Otto Porter. This is vintage Otto Porter. 29 minutes, 12 and 5, two threes, one steal, and four big blocks. Now, the four blocks are obviously not something he's going to do. But in a 14-team league, yeah, take a fly. Why not? Same with Damian Lee, who had 18 points and five triples starting in place of Poole. Steph had 30 points with four threes and two blocks, and Draymond had a 16-11-10 triple-double. Also had two steals and two blocks. Just a fantastic performance from him. Gaz Payton, some nice stream value. Three steals for Gaza. The Doctor had 12 points with six rebounds as well in those 18 minutes, while Looney did nothing. Zero points in 16 minutes, and Bielitsa in a revenge game had four points. 
uh, 15 minutes for Nemanja. All right, so on to the last game. This was a blowout. The Spurs really kicked the ass of the Clippers here. 116-92. DeJounte Murray played 31 minutes, had a monster, monster game. 24, 12, and 13 with four steals and four threes. He has been amazing. Recently, before this game, he'd been a little bit off, 46 over the last two weeks, but yeah, this is obviously great. Top 25 this season, exceeding literally, I think, everybody's expectations. Pirtle was also massive. 17, 11, and five, three steals and two blocks. Obviously, with Pirtle, you're punting free throws, but the other stuff's awesome. Um, Keldon Johnson, it's very Keldon, isn't it? He had the 12 boards. That's two double-digit rebound games in a row. 12 points, but one assist. At least he had a steal and a block. That's a positive. But shot poorly, didn't get to the line. Um, and while Maximum Derek White had 15, 4, and 4. Yeah, it's two stinkers in a row. Oh, that's not really a stinker, but it's not great from Derek. Dougie McDirt returned, had 16 points in 25 minutes, while Devin Vassell played 26. 6, 8, and 3 on 27 percent is not great. Now, I am holding Devin Vassell. If you are in a situation, though, where you just need to get or well, there's someone else that's hot out there you need to grab. I understand it. But also, if you're in a situation where you're hit with COVID and there's five blokes out, you're probably going to lose the week anyway. So then your yeah, stashing, I think, becomes more viable. Rather than chasing, go, well, man, if I get Alfonso McKinney, that might help me cut into my lead by two fantasy points or some bullshit like that. Right? I think that if you're in that much of a hole this week, that chasing to try and gain one category probably has less worth than holding on to someone who's got more long-term value like Vassell rather than chasing a CJ Miles or some other nonsense player who's not going to have any value once we get past Thursday or something along those lines. For the Clippers, Paul George returned 25-6-6, and six, three steals and three threes. Now, back from his elbow injury, probably some limited minutes and it was a blowout, but that's great to have him back. Well, Zubac had 12-12 twelve and, twelve and three blocks with no Hartenstein and Ibaka. 22 minutes, four and eight. Nothing great there. He's, he's not a 12 or 14 team league guy. With George back, the Duck Luke Kennard continued to start over Nick Batum. Four points, eight rebounds. Of course, no Marcus Morris. That was one of six shooting for Kennard. I talked about him being a sell high. If you didn't execute any sell high, I don't think you're going to be able to do it now. You had to get that window in quickly. Um, probably a drop. Well, Reggie Jackson had 10 points in 20 minutes and BJ Boston, eight points. We had Eric Bledsoe play 24. He had nine, five, and three, but he is still... Just a very, very deep league player. All right, let's move on to the lines of the night. Now, the monstrous, of course, goes to Joel Embiid, who was huge. Your waiver wire line of the night is um, Otto Porter Jr., especially because of those four blocks that he dropped in. The young gun is Halliburton, who was amazing here, and that's a real hot streak for him. And then your dud is Luke Kennard, who I think, again, probably can be a drop if you weren't able to execute that sell high on him. The top 10 players today for nine category leagues. We've got Embiid, DeJounte, Lonzo Ball, Rudy Gobert, Draymond Green, Seth Curry, Tyrese Halliburton, Paul George, Lamello Ball, and Jalen Brown. Your top 10 players who rostered in under 50% of leagues. Otto Porter, 14-team eh, streamer. Kobe White, probably the same, maybe 12 if Crusoe's out. Damian Lee's got some stream value. Jalen McDaniels, that's more because Haywood was out there. McKinney is just a deep league guy. Danny Green for defense. KJ Martin in deeper formats. Armani Brooks is like a 14-team league guy, but maybe not even if Jalen Green returns. Peyton Pritchard's just a watch guy. And then Andre Iguodala is just, a, again, a deep league player. And we look at points leagues to wrap things up here. The top 10 is Embiid, Murray, Gobert, Ball, Draymond, Pirtle, Halliburton, George Brown, and Lamello Ball. Two balls in the top 10. Giggity. That will do it for us today. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. On YouTube, thumb it up, ring my bell, leave your comments down below, share it with friends. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.